good morning. I appreciate uh, everyone uh, getting up early this morning and um, coming to participate in the course. Um, as you know, the course is um, Non-Muscle Invasive Bladder Cancer, uh, Practical Solutions to Common Problems. I'm going to uh, read a few statements from the AUA and some important aspects of the uh, logistics of the course. So uh, AUA policy states that all um, planners, authors, and presenters must disclose prior to their presentation all relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. These disclosures are all posted on the, a on the AUA's annual meeting website, and uh, each of the speakers today will have a slide about their relevant disclosures. Also, there's no photos, videos, or audio recordings that are permitted. Now, uh, importantly, this is an interactive session. We have the audience response system uh, via your cell phone and a cell phone app uh, to uh, allow us to interact with one another. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Lee, who will be the first presenter, will have this slide um, as part of her presentation to kind of help remind you on how to download this app onto your cell phone, uh, um, and, and hopefully you're doing that now. So I'll give you some brief instructions about it. So select the appropriate course um, in your app. Tap on the polling icon located in the bottom menu bar. Tap on the polling icon when the speaker is ready to run the poll. So when the question comes up, be ready to tap on the polling icon and select your response. That The poll will then um, be taken and the results will be delivered and we'll all see them. And the poll is anonymous, so it'll be, it'll be a, the poll of the group and um, th this will be part of the pre-test questions before the presentation. Now to download the app, um, enter your AUA ID and password. If you don't know your ID, your password, I'm sorry I can't give you, but your ID is on, on your badge. So if you're having any trouble um, remembering your ID, it's on your badge. And uh, finally, very important to evaluate the course. It's very good for us as, as the faculty of this course to understand your needs and you know what we can do to improve and get better. But also, it's important to the AUA in terms of knowing what courses are um, desired by by the um, by the populace of members of the AUA and attendees. Which courses do you desire to be to, to be to be at the course next year? So, please. Uh, um, evaluate the course. Now, importantly, there, is, there are a few perks for you if, uh, if you do um, evaluate the course. First is, um, for every course uh, evaluation that you complete at the AUA this year, so any course, including this one, obviously, your name will be entered in a drawing for a complimentary registration to next year's AUA meeting in Washington, D.C., and the winners will be announced in June, so please fill it out. You might have a chance to have a free um, registration next year to the AUA. Again, you can do that through the AUA mobile app um, to, to evaluate the course. Please do it right after the course uh, before leaving the room. That hopefully would, would be best and allow you to remember to do it. And uh, you can do that by visiting the planner through our website, AUA2019.org, um, and uh, please evaluate the course. There will be a post-test that will be sent out within 24 to 48 hours if you've attended this course to see your retention of uh, the, the questions that, uh, that we presented in the course. And finally, if you do complete this post-test survey, another potential perk, there will be a random drawing for $150, um, $150 Visa gift card. Um, so if you please complete the post-test, so a couple of perks. Uh, the first speaker today is Dr. Cheryl Lee from Ohio State University, and uh, she's going to discuss uh, the... Uh, AUA non-muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines, some of the very relevant and high points of that guideline, critical aspects of caring for these patients. Dr. Lee. Well, good morning, everybody. I was hoping if um, the perk set you got from filling out the evaluation was going to be like a car or something like that. Turns out it's it's free registration till next. I mean, a drawing for registration for next year. Um, so, good morning to everyone. I'm going to review. Uh, part of the AUA guidelines for non-muscle invasive disease, mostly on the sides of diagnosis uh, and uh, staging. And then Dr. Witches is going to be taking the latter half of the guidelines and talking more about treatment, particularly along the categories of risk. So um, I have no, uh, excuse me, I just want to confirm that these are the correct updated slides. Okay, and can you check that? Because I feel like this slide is off here. But um, So this is, again, the audience response uh, system directive. Uh, if you can, please download that app. Hopefully you've been doing that. Um, and you'll be able to find the session that this is in right now. 
Um, you'll be able to uh, answer the poll once we get the next the question up, and then we'll ultimately be able to see it. You're not going to get the answer now. Oh, we're going to have a post-test at the end of the talk, and we'll be able to see those then. So uh, question one, restaging TURBT should be performed in all of the following scenarios except which one? Incomplete initial resection, uh, clinical T1 urothelial bladder cancer, clinical T1 micropapillary bladder cancer, and completely resected two centimeter pun lump or papillary urothelial neoplasia of low malignant potential. Okay, so right now you should be, uh, I think, tapping the pole. Okay. As with any good technology, there has to be a little breakdown of the technology for, for a bit just to make it real. This is a credible <laughs> program here. Looks like we'll reboot. Okay. So hopefully this is giving you a little extra time to go ahead and get that app downloaded. Anybody having a problem with it? Okay. If so, I mean, you can see our uh, ARS team on this side. Okay. Okay, great. So you guys are, you've already seen this question. <laughs> we can do the next slide. Mine slide isn't, isn't advancing. Okay, great. We're, we're there. We're there. Usually get about 15 seconds. Okay, so it looks like the vast majority of folks have said the uh, pun lump. Question two, a patient with a four centimeter low grade TA bladder tumor is considered minimal risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk? You can go ahead and tap the poll and vote. Okay, now we'll be able to see the results. Okay, looks like many people said intermediate risk. Okay. Okay, question three. In a patient with intermediate risk bladder cancer, upper tract surveillance should be performed how often? Every three months, every six months, every six to 12 months, or every 12 to 18 months? Okay, we're tapping the poll. Got about 15 seconds. Okay, and it looks like most people are saying uh, 12 to 18 months, although some said 6 to 12. All right, great. So now, so now we'll talk a little bit about the guidelines. And this was, um, you know, approved in 2016, but the AUA has done a good job more recently of updating guidelines along the way so, uh, so that the recommendations remain relevant. Um, and the reality of it is, is this is, you know, a huge endeavor, uh, but one that's directed to give us uh, some recommendations on how to manage these patients to derive the best outcomes that we can that are based in evidence. They're not perfect, and it doesn't cover every scenario. Um, in part, uh, that's the purpose of some of these kinds of courses, to talk about what happens beyond the, the guidelines. But today, we're talking about the guidelines, because it's important to know this, these kinds of questions 
are on the in-service uh, exams for residents, but also the research uh, for practicing urologists. Having a, I'm on the left side. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. So um, the good news is, in approaching the management of non-muscle invasive disease, uh, there's really um, been inertia towards having a risk-based strategy for uh, diagnosis, treatment, and even surveillance now. So I think it's important for us to review the risk stratification. Low risk uh, non-muscle invasive disease is essentially that first time tumor that's low volume, low grade TA. It also includes the category of pun lump, which we don't see that often, but those would be our low risk, uh, that would be the low risk category. Intermediate risk is going to include those recurrent uh, low grade TA, high volume low grade TA, and multifocal low grade TA. In addition, it includes the um, low volume high grade TA. We all have seen those tiny tumors that wind up being high grade. And the very rare uh, as hen's teeth low grade T1 that on occasion will be seen on a pathology report. The uh, high risk category includes invasive tumors, high grade T1, and uh, also recurrent, high volume, uh, and multifocal uh, high grade TA. Um, this category also includes CIS and uh, other parameters or performance of the tumor and characteristics of the tumor that are associated with more negative outcomes. And those were um, newly uh, incorporated into the guidelines uh, in 2016. The, uh, here you're seeing those types of parameters. Um, variant histology, lymphovascular invasion, involvement in the prostatic urethra, particularly high-grade disease, and then uh, patients who have failed BCG. So those are going to be the high and highest risk uh, patients. Later on in the course, Dr. Witches will talk a little bit about the guidelines over in Europe, and there are some slight distinctions in this area, and they uh, even subcategorize a highest risk group. But as of now, you could think of those all within this high risk context. The, um, I think one of the foundations of being able to manage non-muscle lung disease successfully is one, to be able to perform a thorough cystoscopic exam uh, and also a solid and thorough and complete TURBT. It's a common procedure we do. Um, it's important that we get it right. The, uh, the good news is, is that we have uh, over time been uh, gaining more access to uh, enhance diagnostics to help us improve our TURBT. And in fact, even um, we are now even using crowdsourcing to think about how we can improve our own technical skill so that again we get the best outcomes uh, from TURBT. The um, one strategy in uh, performing a high quality TURBT is to use a checklist. This is a checklist that was developed by Chris Anderson when he was still at Memorial, uh, along with Harry Herr, and uh, they essentially did a lot of retrospective work to identify 10 key elements of TURBT and of high quality TURBT. They then enlisted uh, several other centers from around the US and said, Let's look at some of your prior cases and tell us how many of these elements were present in, uh, in the reports, uh, how much of this had actually been done and documented. Now certainly it's possible that some things were done and not documented. But in general it gives you a sense of the thoroughness of the TUR and what kinds of information the surgeon was looking towards and uh, highlighting. Then they instilled this checklist prospectively. 
and had uh, surgeons then do a TUR and then look and see, and then we looked at uh, pathology reports, we looked at operative notes to say, okay, now after you've uh, seen the checklist, it's been implemented, you're doing it prospectively, now how many of these elements are we seeing that you're capturing in your TUR? Can we enhance the quality of the TUR? The primary outcome actually was to uh, determine whether there was a higher rate of muscle within the specimen, uh, and that was the, the primary endpoint. So you'll see in the middle the number of elements and the percentage of elements that uh, were present before the checklist was implemented. And the column all the way to the right is after. What you're going to see is that the checklist did actually uh, encourage people to be aware and document and perform these key elements of the TURVT. And some of these include exam under anesthesia, how the tumor was resected, the completeness of the resection, looking visually to see that there's muscle, visually seeing that there's a complete resection. The, um, I think when you look at the visual sense of there being a complete resection or the visual sense of there being detrusor at the base of the muscle, excuse me, at uh, the base of the resection, that also importantly improved. It did not, however, translate into an actual increased uh, proportion of tumors with muscle in the specimen. Um, it was higher, but not, not statistically significant. However, those surgeons who were able, to, who typically had completed all the elements of the checklist, did have a higher proportion of muscle in the specimen of the tumors, suggesting that this may have helped in performing a more thorough and high quality GURBT. The other thing that's important as we think about diagnosis is our access now to enhanced cystoscopic techniques. And blue light cystoscopy uh, using CISVIEW probably has the most data out there, and that is now incorporated into the guidelines. So if someone has access to it, it's recommended that it be used in the diagnosis of non-muscle invasive disease. How many people are using blue light in the room? Just a show of hands. Okay, probably at least 10, 15 percent. Um, we also know that for the patient, uh, particularly with a positive cytology uh, and a negative cysto, that it's important to sample the prostatic urethra. Later on in the course, Dr. Kamada is going to talk a little bit more about the prostatic urethra and some of the uh, uh, importance of sampling that and the timing of doing that sampling. But up to 40% of patients may actually have involvement of the prostatic urethra, so it's really important uh, to, solve that, to sample uh, this area. It can be an important predictor of invasive disease. As we think about enhanced cystoscopy, uh, again, uh, at the time of TUR, if someone has access to it, they should use it. Uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, still I would say many people do not have access to it. So uh, although it's suggested, it's ob obviously not going to be applicable uh, to everyone. But I think certainly in challenging cases, uh, if you have um, a referring center that you can send to, that is another, another option. You may uh, remember that the use of CISVIEW is essentially leveraging photodynamic diagnosis to improve and enhance the uh, visualization of tumors that may be there under white light but less obvious. And you see some of this in the diagrams where under the blue light, the fluorescence is helping us see those tumors a little bit better. And we do know that the CISVIEW can enhance our detection of tumors. Not only TA and low-grade tumors that are probably going to be fairly low risk to the patient, but also can enhance our ability to see T1 tumors by about 10 to 15 percent and also carcinoma in situ by 30 to 45 percent. Um, importantly, if you follow these patients over time, the median time to recurrence is going to be longer in the patients who have had their TURs with CISVIEW. In other words, thinking that we're probably doing a better TURBT. Now, uh, last year, um, a uh, report came out uh, led by uh, Sia Dineshman uh, from USC who reported the results of a phase three study uh, that involved several centers looking at blue light using flexible cystoscopy. Now this has been used in Europe long before now, but we have, haven't had the approval to do that through the FDA in this country, and so this was an important 
uh, study in that regard. But it compared blue and white light flexible cystoscopy uh, with CISVU in the ambulatory setting. 304 patients were evaluated who had uh, a high risk of recurrence. A little over 100 of these patients actually had biopsies for suspicious lesions. 63 had a confirmed cancer. Now 13 of those, or roughly about 20 percent, only uh, were seen with the blue light. So the blue light was able to pick up tumors that were not seen well under white light. Additionally, 26 of those cancers that were detected were found to be CIS. So a substantial percent of those carcinoma in situ lesions were seen only with the blue light. Excuse me, um, I should say roughly 35 percent of those carcinoma in situ lesions were seen only with the blue light. The false positive rate uh, for blue and white light was pretty similar at about 9 percent. So there really is a sense that this can be used in the ambulatory setting. There certainly are questions or, and or concerns around workflow in a clinic, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later during, uh, during our case. Um, there have been certainly issues around reimbursement uh, for CISFU, but last year there uh, were some enhancements in that, and in addition some ex expansions in the indications of uh, the use of CISFU. And uh, so now there is an expanded indication for use with flexible cystoscopy for surveillance, as we were just discussing with that recent clinical trial, detection of carcinoma in situ, uh, repeated use. So previously it had been uh, approved just for really one-time use, although many were using it outside of that context. But now given data that's been reported, uh, the indication has been approved by the FDA for an expanded use, uh, repeated, repeated use. And also it can be used in the context of diagnosis, uh, staging, and also surveillance. Additionally, there was a complexity adjustment payment, uh, so codes allowing uh, for reimbursement of the technical fees, certainly in the hospital-based uh, hospital setting, not in the office-based setting. Now, urinary markers were uh, reviewed extensively by the guidelines panel. Uh, everything from cyt cytology, uh, immunocyte, uh, um, ure urovision fish, uh, and multiple, multiple markers. In the end, after a long series of analyses, what they found was there were some important pearls that we should be thinking about in terms of urinary markers. One, we're not ready to replace cystoscopy with uh, urinary markers at, that uh, at this time. Now, having said that, there's an increasing number of markers now being developed that are uh, getting better and having higher performance. So we'll see what happens, whether that's the uh, CX bladder. I mean, we'll, we'll see over time, but our traditional um, markers, cytology, et cetera, really aren't really performing at a level that we could use that to, to re replace cystoscopy at this time. Um, additionally, for the patient who's low risk, and they're undergoing surveillance and have a normal cystoscopy, they really do not routinely need urinary markers. So we should not be using urinary markers as we survey our patients who are low risk, who've had a history of a low grade TA tumor. Um, the other thing to note in thinking about response to therapy is that some biomarkers can be used to assess response to intravesical BCG. Um, Dr. Kamat's group, uh, several years ago, I remember, uh, came out with a study looking at uh, the use of fish, I think, uh, right after uh, the completion of induction BCG. And I think whether the fish was positive or negative uh, prior to the induction course, that was a predictor for increased progression and increased recurrence. So there are times when we can consider use of urinary markers like fish uh, to look at response uh, to therapy. Additionally, uh, fish and other markers like uh, immunocyte can be used to adjudicate an equivocal cytology. Now, of course, it's really important for one to know uh, one's cytopathologist, how they read, um, and what types of uh, comments you're going to be able to translate into a, a suspicious, an atypical, a dysplastic or positive lesion. So it's important to really know your cytopathologist and how they read. What about restaging TUR? 
Um, for the patient who has non-muscle invasive disease and a component of a variant histology, we know um, that those patients are going to have a higher risk for recurrence and potentially uh, progression. The um, important issue is if the patient is committed to bladder preservation, that we should really be optimizing the staging in that patient, and they should be restaged uh, with restaging to UR. In the same context, if a non-muscle invasive tumor has been previously resected, but the resection was incomplete for whatever reason, it is important to go back and continue to achieve a complete uh, TUR. So that restaging TUR uh, or completion TUR is important, even if that's happening over two to three stages. The patient that is higher risk, particularly with higher volume, high grade TA, also uh, is a good candidate for restaging TUR, again, to really uh, ensure a complete uh, TUR and accurate staging. And certainly the patient with invasive disease, with T1 tumor, uh, should have a, a repeat TUR to ensure muscle in the specimen, but even if there is muscle in the specimen, to ensure that we haven't missed microscopic disease that is uh, invasive into the muscularis propria. The variant histology um, is worthwhile to think about. I mean, this is a smaller number of cases, but seemingly increasingly as the pathologists pay more attention to it. There is some discordance between TUR and cystectomy, but we know that variant histologies do have worse outcomes. They tend to uh, also predict upstaging at cystectomy, and then the responses to intravesical therapy are, are variable. Uh, additionally, variants can be missed by uh, pathologists in the community that are not used to looking at a large volume of bladder pathology. And these are some, uh, some types of variant histology that have been seen, shown to be commonly missed by pathologists. So certainly that re-review by pathology is important to really clarify what type of histology one is dealing with. The restaging TUR should be done in the context of a two to six week window. Um, the, uh, generally speaking, up to about 30% of patients uh, will have uh, upstaging and that will change or alter their management. Uh, rates of residual disease resected on the second TUR are variable. Um, they can be quite high, particularly if there was no muscle, no muscle in the initial specimen. Um, when uh, muscle has been absent and restaging TUR then occurs, it can be as high as 50% or more with residual disease. So again, it's relevant because about a third of the cases are gonna be, uh, are gonna have their management plan changed. Um, this is a uh, re recent review a, uh, of patients uh, in 31 different trials uh, essentially over 8,400 individuals who had high-grade TA or T1 disease and uh, underwent uh, re-TUR. So in this uh, systematic review, there was still a clear, clear evidence that after the first TUR, after the initial and primary TUR, for patients with TA disease, there was as much as 60 plus percent residual disease left in the bladder. Now, these are studies that were reviewed from 2016 and 2017. So these are cases that in theory should be done in the era of restaging to UR and potentially in the uh, context of enhanced diagnostics. But not all of these patients obviously had that. For patients with T1 disease, there was again a wide range of residual tumor after the primary tumor, and that was 20 to 71%. Uh, percent. And upstaging was significant when re-TUR was done, particularly in patients with T1 disease. It was as high as 32% uh, restaging, um, residual disease on restaging. This group in this systematic review found that there was a clear advantage, particularly for patients with TA disease, to have restaging TUR because those who uh, did had recurrence rates in the range of 16%. Those that did not had much higher rates of recurrence, around 58%. There wasn't a clear trend for patients with T1 in this review. And the benefits for progression and overall survival were not particularly clear. <laughs>
Um, at Memorial, in, in their series of almost 900 patients, some who had gone under undergone uh, TUR and re-TUR, they also showed that patients with re-TUR had improved rates of recurrence or improved recurrence-free survival. And in fact, in multivariable analyses, the only uh, factor that was important uh, uh, in terms of reduction of recurrence uh, at five years was um, was the TUR. So those patients who only had a single TUR had a higher risk of recurrence at five years. Um, risk adjustment has also been extended to surveillance. So in thinking about um, how you're going to survey patients, I mean, we do some of this already, but for the low-risk patient, uh, that first surveillance cystoscopy uh, can really uh, be performed at six to nine months, and that is on the heels of uh, really a great study that came out of Europe really showing that for these patients that are low risk that we don't need to be aggressive with their follow-up, and in fact that reduction, uh, uh, reduction in the uh, frequency of the follow-up um, did not result in worse uh, outcomes in terms of recurrence or progression for those patients. So uh, if those patients are negative or have no residual cancer at six to nine months at that first uh, diagnostic cystoscopy, then they can be followed annually. Now in Europe, I think after five years, they stop following these patients if they have no evidence of disease. Many patients here aren't fully comfortable with that, but I think you can uh, certainly use that as a guide to uh, really uh, spread out the surveillance in these patients. Um, additionally, if they're asymptomatic with no recurrence, they don't need upper tract imaging. The, uh, and that helps reduce the exposure, uh, radiation exposure and reduce the cost. For those with intermediate risk disease, uh, those patients are having uh, cystoscopy and cytology, so of course use of a marker every three to six months for a couple years, then every six to 12 months for a couple years, and then annually, with upper tract imaging happening every one to two years. And for high risk, it's, a, it's more, uh, more rigorous and more akin to what uh, the traditional surveillance had been. In other words, uh, every three months for the first couple years, every six months for the next couple years, and then every uh, uh, year after that, at four or five years with no evidence of recurrence. And likewise, upper tract imaging every one to two years if the patient's asymptomatic. So just a few take-home points about the guidelines. These do address many areas that are very common that we deal with. Um, they are based on evidence and expert opinion, um, and the guidelines are striving to enhance our diagnostic, therapeutic, and surveillance uh, of these patients. Um, so I do think we should be working to integrate these guidelines into our practice to improve our outcomes. Um, just because of time, what I'd like to do probably is save questions to the end. And we have the post-test, and then I have just a quick case uh, that maybe our panel members can help, help me with. Um, so we're going to go back to the post-test now, so if you can go back to your polling on your app. Uh, do we need to do it on the app again? We don't. Okay. So, okay. So restaging TURBT should be performed in all of the following scenarios except incomplete resection, T1 disease, that's urothelial T1 micropapillary, or resected two centimeter pun lump. Most people, I think, did have a uh, pun lump. It's a very low risk um, type of uh, uh, condition, and in general, it would not need uh, restaging uh, TUR. So I think pretty much everybody got that. A patient with a four centimeter low grade TA bladder tumor is considered intermediate risk, and I think most of the people put that down. This is a higher volume uh, tumor, so it does fall into that intermediate risk category. And then the third question, in a patient with intermediate risk disease, how often should we be uh, doing their upper tract imaging? This is provided that they're not having problems. And I think most of the people did say uh, kind of every one to two years. So uh, that just meant, I guess, that you did not need this lecture. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Um, let's do a quick, just a quick case. Um, so a gentleman in his uh, mid-70s presented with a history of some hematuria uh, to his uh, family physician. Um, he did have a history of tobacco use. His uh, family physician 
did get a, uh, a CT urogram as part of his workup. In general, he was a relatively healthy gentleman. He did have some coronary artery disease. It had a stent. It was on Plavix. He'd had some orthopedic procedures. And this is just the, um, the CT that, uh, that was obtained. You can see a little mass here, a small bladder mass. Um, and I cystoed him in the office, and he had a one and a half centimeter tumor um, uh, at the right lateral wall. It appeared to be papillary. It actually appeared to be low grade. And then he also had what looked like a small tumor, uh, probably a half a centimeter near the bladder neck. So I'd like to ask our uh, panel members, perhaps Dr. Pohar, um, when thinking about approaching this patient for TUR, when do you use CISVIEW? When do you avoid it? Um, are you using it for surveillance with uh, flexible cystoscopy in the office? And if so, how do you manage workflow in the clinic? But also even maybe you could just describe how you manage the workflow of CISVIEW in the OR too, in that pre-op area. Stand here. So my own personal approach is, you know, the, the, um, a, the uh, guideline or the FDA approval of CISVIEW is really for anyone first time diagnosis of you suspect they have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So anyone with papillary disease in the bladder at first presentation, I think that's a high utility of using CISVIEW. Also in anybody that has recurrent papillary disease of the bladder with a prior history of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, the recurrence again is suggested in the opinion of the um, physician that this is recurrent non-muscle invasive disease. It's, it's another very high level use of CISVIEW. The other area is an abnormal urine cytology in the face of a normal white light cystoscopy, obviously trying to detect carcinoma in situ, this technology has much greater sensitivity when you look at all the studies of finding carcinoma in situ. So I think those are the high level indications. Those are the ones based on the FDA label. And so that's personally, you know, where I implement it to that level. In terms of surveillance cystoscopy, I think there's a nice article. It's in Nature Reviews Urology. It's, a, it's, a, it's an article that's just come out from a group of individuals who use the technology a fair bit following this flexible cystoscopy trial, and it's certainly not for everybody. There's no recommendation that blue light surveillance cystoscopy is valuable for everyone. But looking at that publication, I think, would be important of looking at the high-risk group. The first follow-up cystoscopy certainly would be beneficial. The intermediate risk group, the first follow-up cystoscopy would be beneficial. And there's a stratified guideline of when to consider it, you know, downstream of that. And in terms of the workflow, we don't have it at our institution yet. We're hopeful to get it. But um, it does take some work. But at the same time, you know, re reality is patient needs to arrive about an hour prior to the procedure to have the drug instilled in the bladder. So that's really what you're looking at is resources to instill the drug one hour prior to the procedure. The procedure itself doesn't take much longer. At most, it may be an extra one to two minutes to flip to the blue light mode to evaluate the bladder on top of the white light. So, you know, that, that, that's certainly how I feel about the technology. Thank you. No, has no relevance. The, the latter point I didn't know. I didn't. I don't know what the disposable pack is, but yes, the technology. Oh, the drug. I see. Appreciate the feedback. So there is a cost component. So, so, um, and that's a very valid point that we hear from a lot of people when they're we ask as to why you've not adopted this technology in your office or your group practices or even your hospital system. Um, again, full disclosure, uh, I do. Uh, I am advising this company, but. There is a medical device company that's working on technology that they actually had at the AUA uh, in one of the booths where you have the entire uh, filter lens in the camera head of a system that can fit onto a scope uh, and a lens from any manufacturer. So that is being developed. That would obviously help cut down the cost. The drug will still be the same. So it's still the same CISVIEW, still everything. It's just that the actual camera head and the light source and everything will be in one device, and then you could plug it into any lens, any recycle scope that you have. So the goal there is to reduce the cost so that more people can adopt it. Fantastic. Just one last qu point on this case. <coughs> Dr. Witchies, 
Um, would you use any perioperative uh, installation uh, with chemotherapy in this patient? Um, if so, if you're considering what agent would you use and um, where do you deliver it? In the OR or in the recovery room? Um, I guess cytology was negative. You didn't mention that. So cytology, is, cytology is negative. Okay, it's a low-grade tumor, so I would indeed consider one uh, post-op installation. Uh, we, by the way, do that with epirubicin. It has a little bit less side effects than mitomycin C, which is basically, I think, in Europe, the thing that's uh, mostly used. I'll come back to that in my presentation. There was a nice study on uh, gemcitabine here from the U.S., um, and we deliver it on the ward because our nurses on the ward have a little bit more experience in what comes in and what comes out because you really have to make sure that what goes in also comes out unless you might have a problem and on the OR is impractical and the uh, recovery ward, I don't think they are knowledgeable enough to do that. Um, with the uh, results coming out of the SWOG 0337 study with intravesical gemcitabine, um, I think many of us are converting our use of mitomycin C in the, in the perioperative setting to gemcitabine. In that study that lead author was admissing on that, really they looked at uh, over 400 patients that were randomized to either saline or to gemcitabine, and essentially what you're seeing is the fact that gemcitabine had a significantly lower risk of recurrence in patients that had were truly pathologically uh, low grade that even had a better benefit with close to a 50% reduction in the risk of recurrence. So I do think that's something that we, we should be thinking about, and I will stop there. Okay, Cheryl, thank you very much. Um, I will sort of go on with uh, more or less the same uh, patients, uh, same lecture, because Cheryl already uh, addressed some of the things that I'm going to repeat shortly. Um, I also have some questions. Let me see whether that happens. I, I do have some conflicts of interest, a lot, but they're not relevant for this um, lecture. Um, so you already saw the auto response system. We have 31 participants in the first round. Let's see how many we have now. This is the first question. Um, patient with multiple recurrent small TA bladder tumors is considered by both the EAU and the AOA risk uh, guideline as low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, or very high risk. Okay, so most are voting for intermediate risk. And the number of participants went down. We have 25 now. Okay, guys, come on, keep awake. Eh? It's early, I know, but take care. So next question. In case of BCG shortage, which I understand is a real problem in the U.S., fortunately not yet in Europe, but in case of BCG shortage, there are several options to use less BCG. Which option mentioned below is not recommended? A, reduce the maintenance therapy in TA high-grade disease from three years to one year. B, to use two instead of three installations during the maintenance phase. C, to reduce the maintenance dose to one-third dose to be able to treat more patients with the same vial of BCG. Or D, to use six months of one-third dose of BCG in case of carcinoma situ, since this is not invasive. Okay, majority goes for uh, the CIS uh, story but this is something to uh, discuss. And we're, going, we're going up, we're going up. We're now at 36, so improving. So my last uh, response question. In low-risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer, the AOA guideline recommends that the TOR should be followed by a single post installation within six hours, a single post installation within 24 hours, 
a single postman installation with this jump site bin, or a single postman installation followed by a six month course of chemotherapy, intravascular chemotherapy. Okay, so probably single post of installation, whatever you use, and then within six or 24 hours. We'll come to that later during the presentation and when we uh, treat those questions again at the end. Okay, so if you're gonna treat patients with non muscle invasive bladder cancer, point one and point two and point three and point four is do a good TOR. You will never compensate a bad TOR with whatever intravascular therapy you're gonna use. So make sure that you do a good TOR use a schedule, use maybe enhanced cystoscopy, maybe do a read ur but make sure that you resect the tumor uh, in, uh, in total and completely before starting with the rest. It is good for diagnosis, but this is also very important as therapy. You will gain therapy with a good TUR. Cheryl already showed you the risk groups. I will compare the European risk classification with the uh, classification that's in the AOA guideline. So low risk is actually more or less the same. Uh, you understand it's the low grade, solitary, small TA tumor and pun limp. And you see that that's more or less the same in the uh, EAU guideline. We specifically added their primary and obviously no CIS, but I think that makes sense. Then you have the high risk group, which for the European classification is actually quite easy. TA, uh, sorry, T1 or high grade or CIS and then the relatively uncommon group of multiple and recurrent and large low-grade DA tumors. You don't see them a lot, whereas the American classification is a little bit more complicated. There's a lot of patients, a lot of groups in that high-risk classification. Cheryl already showed you that. And uh, the European classification for intermediate is very easy, that's the rest, uh, but that's actually the majority of your patients and it's better class classified in the AOA classification. So that's typically your recurrent or larger or multiple low-grade TA tumors. These are the major differences. You see that high-grade TA is considered intermediate risk for the AOA classification, whereas that's high risk in the AU definition. And you see that some of these more nasty tumors are not mentioned in the EU guideline with high risk, but they are in the highest risk group. So we don't have minimal risk group, but we have low, intermediate, and high, and a very high risk group. And that's basically not defined by the AOA, but that's in the high risk group for the AOA. Typically, T1, G3 associated with carcinoma in situ, multiple, large T1, G3, or high grade with recurrent T1, high grade, CIS and the prostatic urethra, again, we're gonna talk about that, but that's a nasty disease. Some forms of variant histology and lymphovascular invasion. We saw that again several times during this meeting that lymphovascular invasion really also in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is a nasty tumor. Can you subclassify? Because for example, the intermediate risk group is a large group, that's probably the largest group that we treat. And Ashish has, with another group of people, looked at that. And there are a few factors which can help you sub-classify the intermediate risk group. And I will show you in a few slides that this has potential therapeutic consequences. So the number of tumors, one versus more than one, the size, smaller or larger than three centimeters, timing of the recurrence soon, within a year or after a year, and the frequency of recurrence, less than once a year, or more often than once a year. And you can already envision that if you have some of these factors, you will probably be on the high end of intermediate risk, whereas if you have none of these factors, then it's really on the low end of intermediate risk. Uh, you can, and I will show you that in a few moments, you, will, you can use this subclassification to uh, uh, subclassify the rest of your intermediate tumors. High risk also, large group, especially if you look at the uh, classification given by the AUA. Um, and again, certainly has been shown a few times during abstracts and presentations during this Congress, 
important factors in high risk, which make it even worse, is a very invasive T1 tumor. So if it's almost a T2, it's called T2B or T2C. Lymphovascular invasion recently again looked at in a large meta-analysis where it really comes out as a very bad prognostic sign. And uh, it was also a carcinoma site too, together with a high-risk papillary tumor. And then there are several other factors which might be important, but these are the most predominant factors that make a high-risk patient very high risk, which might have therapeutic consequences. For example, you might choose not for intravascular therapy, but for upfront cystectomy. Can we use markers? She already told you. I've spent, I think, 25 years of my life on markers. And, you know, we did some in the 90s and in the beginning of the century. We stopped doing that then, you know, between 2005, 2010. But now because of new techniques, markers are again popular. They are dealt with, they are done. Uh, still not really in clinical practice, but I'm sure that within a few years they will be used in clinical practice. By the way, I also stated that in my thesis in 1992, and they're not used at all, so I hope this time I'm more or less right. But anyway, there are several uh, sorts of markers that are used in non muscle invasive bladder cancer, and those are methylation markers. We've seen a few abstracts on methylation during this meeting. For example, this is a study where they used methylation markers and were able to really subclassify three risk groups, you see, with a very large difference, or microRNAs. They're also used in tests to predict whether patients do well. For example, in this case, tumor progression of non-muscle invasive tumors to muscle invasive tumors, or whether patients do not do very well. These results do need external validation. You see abstracts every year in Europe, in the US, and next year, other abstracts. This should be validated and implemented, but epigenetics are coming. I'm really sure that now, within a few years, we will use tests in clinical practice. I'm already doing that. So. We've got our patients, the puzzle is complete. We know what he has, he's intermediate or low, we've done a good TOR. So how are we gonna do the additional treatment? Treatment one is to advise patients to stop smoking. It's both in your guideline and the European guideline. Just by show of hands, who sends smokers to a psychologist or gives him advice to do non-smoking? Who does that? Great, that's a lot because Accidentally, walking around in Chicago, I still, still a lot of people smoke. And if I see it, for example, the Netherlands, it's, it's really almost gone. So really try to get your patients off cigarettes. That's advice number one, important. So then we have the low-risk patients, and we already discussed that a little bit. Basically, you're gonna give those patients a single post of insulation of chemotherapy. So in the guideline of 2016, that's not specifically specified and do that within 24 hours. You shouldn't do that after a week. You should do that as soon as feasible, as soon as possible, as soon as logical. So within 24 hours or the same day. And you don't need more. This should be enough. And that's the same for the EU guideline. This is a recent update done by Richard Sylvester. He was the chief statistician of the EORTC. He's got a lot of data on his computer and he looked at the studies that have been done with a single post of ventilation, over 2,000 patients, and indeed he found again, he already did that 10 years ago, he found again that with, sorry, he found again that with one insulation you definitely will reduce the recurrence rate, in this case, in this meta-analysis, from around 60% to around 45%. And that's not only statistically significant, but I really think that's relevant for the patient and relevant for the costs. Survival, obviously, with these low-risk patients is not influenced. Beware, this is only really effective in the low-risk patients. In high-risk patients, when you are going to treat anyway with BCG or mitomycin C, the uh, value of single post insulation definitely is not as big. Well, Cheryl already showed you this uh, trial uh, done by Ed Messing, and um, they used 400 patients, gave one hour of gemcitabine, two grams in 100 ml, and you see that the four-year recurrence rate definitely dropped. Again, well, not totally 15%, but almost, definitely more than 10%, and predominantly because of the low-grade patients. You see in the low-grade patients, 215 of those, there was an almost 20% difference in the recurrence rate. So again, the advantage is there, 
predominantly because of low-risk patients. It's safe. A lot of urologists have been afraid of giving a single postman installation because of potential problems. But basically, you have to realize that it is safe. No significant differences, no significant side effects. So it's safe and effective. It reduces the recurrence rate within four years. And of course, we have to look at other drugs, whether they have the same result. Here you see the graphs. You see the side effects, which is really extremely low. And here you see the difference in the whole group, but also the difference in the low-risk group, where you see that it's predominantly caused by the low-risk group where the difference exists. Beware. That's why I'm not giving that on the OR, and I'm not giving that in the uh, recovery award. I just had a patient a few years ago who had one installation for a TA tumor. He apparently had a perforation, which was not recovered, and he finally ended up with a shrunken bladder and a fistula, and I had to take out his bladder because of this, because he didn't have any life left. And what you do see if you use mitomycin, I see that a lot when I use mitomycin C, these kinds of calcifications in the bladder at the spot where you've done your resection. You don't read that in literature, but you see that a lot. It has no consequences. It will disappear after a few cystoscopies. But sometimes you do see that, and uh, you shouldn't be afraid if that happens. Is it always done? No, it's not always done. Here you see a very recent article from Urology from this year where low and intermediate miss patients, where it's basically advice and a recommendation, you see that one-third approximately have given intravesical chemotherapy. And the reason for that is usually the urologist is sometimes service area characteristics, your, your setup. I can imagine that sometimes it's difficult if patients leave the same day again. Of course, it's difficult to give a one immediate installation. But in the future, I think we should look at provider and practice level barriers to improve the implementation of one single post installation. What's new in our guideline, uh, and I think it's already common practice here in the, the US, that you can do without patient laser coagulation or just resection or fulguration of a small recurrent DA tumor. It's a weak recommendation, but I know that it is done a lot all over the world, also here in the US. Can you follow those patients up? We do a lot of active surveillance in small renal tumors. We do active surveillance in a lot of prostate cancer patients. Why not do active surveillance in patients with a small TA lesion? You already know that he had a TA. You see a recurrent TA. You know that that is probably TA. Your cytology is negative. So you might as well wait one or two or three cystoscopies to see what happens. And this is a study from uh, the uh, Italian group where they indeed used active surveillance. And on average, you can postpone a next transurethral resection for one to two years. And we had, again, several uh, discussions at this year, AOA for those low-risk patients. Should you do office fulguration, one of the things that Mark Soloway does a lot, should you maybe f follow those patients up? Should you probably do a TOR and a uh, single post installation every time? There are really several ways to roam how to treat these patients, but fulguration and active surveillance are definitely options that you can use. Practical issues in low-risk therapy. Single post ventilation now seems the standard of care, but it's still not always done. Beware of a perforation. Make sure that that doesn't happen. And consider fulguration or active surveillance. Any questions, remarks on patients with low risk, maybe about the single post ventilation, the timing, office fulguration, active surveillance? We've talked about this study. This is a study where they looked at timing of a single post installation, which didn't matter if you do that within six hours or within 24 hours. So you do have some window to do that. OK, let's go to intermediate risk patients. Here, you have to give both guidelines suggest to give one single post installation followed by something more. So the American guideline says that you should give a six week course of intravesical chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and if that works, so if there is still a complete response or not a recurrence after three months, you should consider maintenance therapy as tolerated. And a little bit more specifically specified for the EAU, single post installations followed by either one year of chemotherapy or intravesical BCG. We will discuss about how 
to do that now there's a BCG shortage, I think now the first choice will probably be for most patients uh, to give uh, intravascular chemotherapy, but the guideline also says that you could use intravascular BCG. And here that subclassification of the intermediate risk tumors comes in. Like I told you, if you have none of those bad factors, it's almost low risk. So maybe you could even do only one single post installation. If you have all of those risk factors, ah, that's not good. So maybe you should already in that group go for BCG. And if you have a few of those risk factors, one or two, they're not that bad. I think that's the ideal group to do single post-op installation and intervascular chemotherapy. So this is how you can use that subclassification in the intermediate risk group to specify your therapy, to choose between, to safely choose between maybe BCG or maybe intervascular chemotherapy. Any questions about this? You see a very recent article looking at, indeed, BCG use in the era of shortage, especially in intermediate risk patients. And this is a recent meta-analysis which shows that mitomycin C really is very effective. So it's not that if you use mitomycin C instead of BCG that you lose a lot of efficacy. Mitomycin C is really an effective drug, so it's not that much worse. Okay, let's go into the bad boys, high-risk therapy. If you have high-risk disease, I think all guidelines give the same advice, you should be, use BCG. And basically, you should use the SWOG trial, meaning installation, initially six-week course, and then your three months, six months, 12 months, maintenance schedule with three recommendations, three installations per session. And that's both the same for the EAU and the AOA guideline. What to do if there was not enough BCG? Realize that this is a very large trial with 1,500 patients done by the EORTC, where they compared one third dose during one year, that was the least regimen, full dose for one year, one third dose for three years, and full dose for three years. Important conclusion one, that toxicity progression was exactly the same. So there's no difference. There is a difference in recurrence rate. And it makes sense that, but you also see that the more you give, the lower your recurrence rate, so the higher your disease-free survival is. But see that in five years, the difference between the worst group and the most intensively treated group, because that's a huge difference, one year, one third dose, or three years full dose, is only 10% higher recurrence rate. So yes, there is an advantage if you give more, but no, it's not a real major problem. You see more recurrences but not more progression or not more cancer-specific mortality and also not less or more side effects. So this might be something to keep in mind. So safe options are one year recurrence rate, one year maintenance instead of three. Well, you will have a little bit more recurrences, but not that much. Two instead of three maintenance treatments. Again, you will have a little bit more recurrences, but not that much. Maintenance with one third dose, not with the full dose. Again, a little bit more recurrences, but you can treat more patients. And with regard to CIS, because that's the most nasty disease, there's still tumor there, so you really have to treat. Whereas if you have a papillary tumor, that's resected. But in case of CIS, there's still tumor there, which you have to treat. The first year should basically be full dose. You shouldn't use one maintenance schedule treatment, because if you look at a very nice Spanish study, they compared one course of six installations with the same course and one maintenance installation during the SWOG schedule. So at month three, month six, month 12, one installation. And you see that then the difference is not there. So one maintenance installation during your maintenance SWOG schedule basically is not enough. So you have to use at least two. Again, you switch from BCG strain. It was again an abstract here at this AOA. There are differences, um, but Obviously, in the US, there's only one strain which is registered, so that might be a problem. I know that in Europe, in Southern Europe, strains from uh, India are used. There are some differences, but if you change from one strain to the other, if you're allowed to change from one strain to the other, realize that there might be small difference. Both, sorry, both of these two trials showed that Thais is a little bit less effective than the Dutch strain or 
the Connaught strain, which unfortunately is not available anymore. So practical issues in high risk. Re-TOR remains controversial. I didn't talk about that. Cheryl said you have to do that. I do not always agree, but anyway, think about it at least and uh, know your options if there is a BCG shortage. Highest risk, um, if you look at the AOA uh, advice, then if those patients uh, recur after three months, you have to use a second course of BCG, but already consider in the worst cases with CIS, lymphovascular invasion, variant histologies, also consider and offer radical cystectomy. And obviously in BCG on responsive patients, cystectomy or, and Ashish will talk about that, think about clinical trials. Fortunately, there are several clinical trials currently available, so that's nice. EAU basically uh, says if there is a high-risk patient or a very high-risk patient or BCG unresponsive, the way to go is radical cystectomy. Bladder preservation can be considered, which is intravascular chemo, chemotherapy with microwave-induced hyperthermia, but the experience is limited and they are considered oncologically inferior. So practical issues with high risk disease. Maybe in the future we're going to do profiling, select responders, select non-responders, mind new strategies, so keep up with the developments, and you know that there are new drugs tested in these patients, especially the PDL1 antagonists that are now in trial in non BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Cystectomy will be covered by a sheath. Some of these preservation strategies, gemcitabin, we showed that already for one installation is also effective in uh, BCG-treated uh, patients, so that might be an alternative. Of course, not one installation, but then you have to give the schedule of installation. We are using in Europe, and I'm using it already for almost 20 years, hyperthermia. Here we did a trial comparing hyperthermia with BCG in intermediate and high-risk patients, and we showed in 200 patients that hyperthermia is a little bit more effective than BCG with regard to the recurrence rate. Why does not everybody use that? It's expensive, it's, it's work labor intensive, so there are definitely some drawbacks. But if you have access to that, and I treat a lot of patients with this, uh, it's certainly something to consider. And then here's another study that we recently published where you see that in BCG unresponsive patients, you can even, so they were on the edge of cystectomy, those are the ones I treat, around 50% of those patients still are free of disease after two years. So again, it's not a miracle, but if you have access to intravascular hyperchemotherapy, then that's something to consider. What's around? What do you see here on meetings? What do you hear on congresses? What's not in the guideline yet? Um, sorry, microbacterial cell wall particles is already around for a long time, by the way. There are some studies with that. EMDA, electromotive drug administration. It's also used in the Netherlands for uh, already a longer time, you sort of also boost the effect of mitomycin C with current, a small current gradient. Um, HIVAC, that's another form of intravascular hyperthermia. So you basically just heat the fluid until 45 degrees. Chemo combinations, we've seen a lot also during patient discussions. Uh, a lot of people use then combinations of docetaxel. There is a trial with cabazitaxel and cisplatinum and gemcitabin. So there are several combinations that are used intravesically in patients that are at higher risk. And maybe in uh, BCG unresponsive the patients mind the, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors that are currently in trials. Okay, my take home messages. Initial therapy, again, do a good and complete TOR. That's important for diagnosis and for prognosis and consider a re-TOR. The prognosis use risk groups to differentiate those patients. They have a very different risk profile if you look at that. We call them all non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but there are total differences. Remember additional risk factors, subclassification of intermediate risk, or some factors like lymphovascular invasion, PT1B in high-risk patients. Additional therapy, low risk, single post insulation. Gemcitabin is now popular here in the US. I think that's a good way to go. In intermediate risk, intravascular chemotherapy or BCG, and I guess start with chemo and only in very selected intermediate risk patients, you can use BCG if you are able to subclassify this group. High risk, I don't think much discussion, maintenance BCG. Try to fool around a little bit with the schedule and with the dose, but that's the way to go.
And in high-risk patients, there are all kinds of alternatives, but the mainstay in these patients is cystectomy. Okay, then I had my questions. I hope that they're out here. That, yeah, that wasn't, but it's okay. Um, let's go back here, then I can... So the poll here was um, intermediate risk. And I think that's right, because here we are talking about multiple recurrent small. So that's in both guidelines, intermediate risk. Then here we had, in case of BCG shortage, well, what you shouldn't do is, is reduce a lot in CIS. I think that's obvious. There you really should try to use at least the first year full dose maintenance. And the third question, low risk, AOA guideline recommends the single post installation within 24 hours. So I guess maybe that's currently even gemcitabin, but the guideline says an installation within 24 hours. Okay, thank you for your attention. So I'm going to follow on the heels of Dr. Lee and Dr. Witches. I'm going to talk about um, you know, some of the potential complications of interesticle therapy, obviously a very important aspect in clinical care, and um, really looking at this from the standpoint of how do you prevent the complication? That's all, always the starting point. And if it does occur or side effects happen, recognizing and treating it appropriately. I have no disclosures. So ARS question one. Which of the following statements is not true? The presence of microhematuria is a contraindication to administering BCG. Toxicity profile appears to be similar amongst the different available strains of BCG worldwide. One year of one-third dose BCG has similar toxicity profile, not efficacy but toxicity, as one year of full dose BCG. BCG is contraindicated in an immunosuppressed kidney transplant recipient. Please uh, go ahead and vote. Uh, hopefully all 33, uh, 34 of you will vote. Okay, he's uh, bragging now, 36. <laughs> uh, so uh, the overwhelming majority, uh, microhematuria is, uh, presence of microhematuria is a contraindication administering BCG is not true. Uh, next question. What drug can often be used to treat both uh, E. coli a relatively common uh, organism of urinary tract infection, or Mycobacterium bovis, is a trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, ciprofloxacin, nitrofurantoin, penicillin, or how about isoniazid? Please go ahead and cast your votes. So uh, ciprofloxacin was the highest response, and it really isn't a close second. Question number three. Which of the following statements about single-dose perioperative intravesical chemotherapy is true? So which statement is true? It reduces tumor recurrence rates for both solitary and multifocal low-grade tumors. If you delay the treatment for four hours, there's less risk of complication or side effect. It's contraindicated in the second in the setting of a second TORBT to remove residual papillary disease. A cystogram should be obtained routinely before administering the treatment. Please uh, submit your vote. And, uh, uh, Pretty much um, everyone chose reduces tumor recurrence rates for both solitary and multifocal low-grade tumors. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the talk. So I'm going to start by, by a high-level view, and my, hopefully my, uh, my presentation will highlight uh, these, um, these bullet points about what I'm going to suggest is a, attributes of a fairly successful BCG clinic that's making impact on clinical care in a favorable way. 
So Dr. Lee and Dr. Wichis both emphasized the importance of patients receiving, uh, who have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer not only receiving induction BCG therapy, but it's clear that um, maintenance BCG therapy has significant impact in patients, so the concept of maintenance being well ingrained in the program. There's a concerted effort to ascertain both common local and systemic toxicity, so there's a, some objective tool or, or there's some direct effort in the clinic of how are you going to assess toxicities of intravesical therapy in an objective way, and there's a standardized plan on how you're going to manage the toxicities. BCG treatment discontinuation rates even with maintenance, should be low. It should be less than 10%. BCG sepsis rates are very low these days um, and should be less than 1%. An awareness of unusual and rare BCG toxicities. They occur an awareness, an, an astute level of cl clinical rec recognition or high level of suspicion of what are some rare side effects. So this is a tool that I put up. It's a tool that we use in our clinics. It's not a tool that we developed. It isn't anything um, too earth-shattering, but if this, was, uh, this, was, we, this, this was created by the investigators of a BCG interferon trial that was done many years ago. And what this tool does, it really, it really breaks down common local and systemic toxicities of intravesical BCG therapy. Four of the questions were related to local toxicities of frequency of urination, um, burning on urination, urgency of urination and blood in the urine, and the, I'm sorry about that, and the individual would score um, their symptoms based on these categories of how bothered they are by the symptom. And they would complete it just prior to the treatment before you gave them the drug. They would complete it right after the treatment when they went home that later that night, and then each night of the week until they came back for their next dose, they would score their symptomatology. It allows you to have a global snapshot of what happened that week during the patient's therapy. How did they feel about it? Allows you to assess their potential host immune response. You know, it's a valuable tool as opposed to sitting down, the individual trying to remember, how did I feel five days ago after I got the treatment? What was that like? I mean, this is a very easy snapshot, an easy tool um, for, um, for you to get a good assessment. There's many ways to do it. This is one that um, we personally use in our clinics. Now, prevention is most important. I mean, why does, why does BCG toxicity happen, or why are there, what, what's the risk of significant side effects of BCG absorption? It's really the disruption of the mucosal layer or the epithelium of the lower urinary tract, and you, one needs to be certain that there's no disruption for the safety of the administration of the drug. Where are times that it's not safe, where one is cautious about that? Obviously, following TURBT, you need to wait for an adequate amount of time before administering the drug. Two weeks as a minimum um, would be a, would, is a good standard to follow. A traumatic or difficult catheterization, whether you see blood or not, I mean, the one needs to be cognizant of that in the clinic. If there's any difficulty with the catheterization, one should be cautious about should the drug be given. The presence of gross hematuria and acute bacterial cystitis just makes conceptual sense. I can't say there's high-level data or good annotation that that acute bacterial cystitis truly results in significant rates of BCG sepsis or, or systemic side effects, but it just makes conceptual sense, change in vascular permeability and potential um, absorption of the drug when sh one should not administer it in the setting. Clearly, routine urinalysis is not necessary. The presence of microhematuria is not a contraindication to giving the drug. And the, actually, treating asymptomatic bacteria so having a urine culture that documents the presence of bacteria, but the individual is asymptomatic. There, there, are, there are some observational studies now, more than one, that demonstrate that it's not unsafe to give BCG in that setting. We're all in this situation in clinics sometimes. A patient who's a, who, ha, who has chronic bacteria, you're chasing your tail sometimes and trying to eradicate the bacteria, and they repopulate different organisms worried about continuing to give the BCG, do you stop? The answer is you don't always have to. And there is a study that concurrent eyes and eyes at administration was attempted to reduce toxicities in kind of a randomized trial manner that demonstrate actually you can't reduce, it does not reduce toxicities by giving three days of isoniazid therapy in combination with the treatment. I'm sorry, I'll get this uh, pointer right and go in the correct direction for once. Now, how often do these symptoms occur? I think this is a nice study. It's an EURTC publication study that Dr. Witches had put up. I mean, it's over 1,300 patients. Give some objectivity of how often do symptoms happen. Well, they happen all the time should recognize that patients get symptoms, and 63% of the time they develop the, the local symptoms we're all aware of, 31% of the time systemic symptoms occur, including malaise and fever in 8% of patients. So it's not uncommon for an individual to have a fever associated with the treatment. Even an episode of gross hematuria, somewhere along the course, now this is a study looking at both induction and maintenance, but somewhere along the course of their therapy, 
whether it was one year or three years, the presence of gross hematuria, it happens. It's not uncommon 23% of the time. The BCG sepsis rate, though, in a study of over 1,300 patients was only 0.3%. Now, important, this study did use, a, they had their own tool or their own manner of, of assessing toxicities, and they had a standardized plan that if these toxicities occur, that this is how the individual should respond to managing some of the side effects or toxicities of BCG therapy. And given that, you see that the BCG sepsis rates um, you know, are pretty low. Now, this is very straightforward. Most of the symptoms of BCG therapy, as we all know, they're self-limiting, and treatment is not required. They dissipate within one to two days of the therapy, and they're really a reflection of essentially the host response of the individual and potentially some side effect from the, from the actual bacterium being in the bladder itself. So it'll, it'll resolve in most people. But obviously, if treatment is desired, if the symptomatology is bothering the individual, it's more prolonged, simple measures of anticholinergic therapy, phenazopyridine, or an anti-inflammatory resolve the symptoms in the vast majority of people. Now, there is a, there is a trial or a study, they're a randomized, controlled, double-blinded, uh, placebo study in a small number of patients published several years ago that demonstrated two doses of ofloxacin given um, following BCG therapy actually reduce moderate to severe toxicities by about 20%. So using a fluoroquinolone to which mycobacteria are sensitive um, can help reduce toxicity. So I think that's a very simple tool in your armamentarium. If waiting in patients doesn't resolve the symptoms or the individual is bothered, using anticholinergics, um, phenazopyridine is not helpful, giving a single dose of a fluoroquinolone ciprofloxacin a few hours after the treatment makes sense based on that study. Now, in terms of dose reduction, in terms of toxicities, the study demonstrates this EORT stu EORTC study in very large number of patients, reducing the dose has no bearing on symptomatology. Both local and, both local and systemic symptoms didn't change by dropping the dose to one-third. So reducing the dose really doesn't affect toxicity profile. Also, shortening the maintenance schedule one year versus three years doesn't change the toxicity profile. You know, these are things we always think about, makes conceptual sense. You know, not a pra it is a practice pattern that I, that I had introduced into my own practice I was using a few years ago, but this study clearly demonstrates that with the evolution of knowledge, that reducing the dose doesn't change toxicity profile and shortening the schedule doesn't change your toxicity profile. It's really your own host immune response, an individual's own response. You know, we all have a generalized median of response of what we'll do, but individually we're different. You know, how we respond to that will be slightly different and exhibited by side effect profiles, so that doesn't change anything. But considering alternate, alternate weak therapy, it might be a more rational way to approach that concept, you know, if, you're, if, if, they're, if symptoms are continuing to evolve, some things to think about. Systemic symptoms, this, they're self-limiting in most, and they're managed very simply by antipyretic and anti-inflammatory therapy. Even having a high-grade fever, I mean, one worries about that. But that's not uncommon to develop a high-grade fever. Uh, taking an antipyretic resolves it in most people. The ERTC study was actually recommending to individuals to have a daily dose of isoniazid for the remainder of the therapy that was built into the protocol um, if someone had a high-grade fever and another potential management option. Now, if symptoms persist in a given individual, you know, you're trying a lot of these conservative measures and therapies, you've given the ciprofloxacin, you've made other alterations, you have to be aware of the potential of mycobacterial infection of the lower genital urinary tract. It can occur at any point during the, during the therapy, but often the typical presentation is the induction course is done, the individual overall did fairly well, the symptoms you're most aware of occurred were managed successfully, but Shortly thereafter, a couple weeks later, they're very bothered by symptoms all of a sudden. One needs to be cognizant about the potential fact of potential involvement of the prostate, the epididymis, the testicles, the penis, of the migration of the mycobacterium or the seeding of the mycobacteria retrograde down the tract. Starting isoniazid and rifampin therapy would be important in that situation and to recognize that rarely surgery would be necessary, epididymectomy or chiectomy. I can't remember that I've ever done that for side effects, but certainly, you know, it's a possibility that, 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 that that's something to keep in mind. Now, um, Acute systemic illness. Um, this can occur very randomly. I've had a few patients like this in my practice over time. Can occur um, days, months, or even years later. Very strange new health problems evolved in an individual in the practice. 
you know, many practitioners aren't aware of some of the very late consequences of, um, B, of having prior BCG exposure. And you have to have a high index of clinical suspicion. You can, people can develop um, medical condition of pneumonitis, hepatitis, osteomyelitis, uveitis, mycotic aneurysms. They're seeing subspecialists in the area. Investigations are being done. Causes are not being identified. You know, um, you seeing the patient back and recognizing that some of this is going on might be important to, to realize that they've had BCG exposure before. Calling that um, specialist who's involved in their care, having dialogue, could BCG potentially have been the culprit of this delayed reactivation of an immune response, potentially latent mycobacterial components um, reactivation, very much like the human disease of tuberculosis. Could this be a possibility? I think important to keep that in mind. Often steroid therapy, anti-inflammatory therapy um, leads to a, a good outcome for the individual. But often important to recognize that these very late, strange events, serious health condition for the individual could be related to the BCG that they were given many months ago or maybe even a couple of years ago. When to consider BCG sepsis. Now, um, a high-grade fever in and, of, in and of itself, as we discussed, I mean, one is concerned about that. I mean, there has to be some counseling to the individual to pay attention. But, but antipyretic therapy um, is a reasonable starting point in most individuals, and it, will, and it will resolve. But it's very important that any other concerning symptoms with that high-grade fever, patients nauseated, having confusion, family just doesn't like the look of the individual, the individual just doesn't feel good, important to be cautious. They should present for medical attention and evaluation for the potential suspicion of BCG sepsis or just bacteremia from the actual catheterization, urinary tract infection, and, and to keep that all in mind. So it warrants an evaluation. Most often cultures would be done initially of the urine and the blood, starting fluoroquinolone therapy, and often admission and for observation purposes is a good cautious um, first step. If the fever persists, uh, for greater than 48 hours on fluoroquinolone therapy, uh, and, and there's a high potential thresh risk potential for BCG sepsis, obviously starting um, anti-TB therapy is important. Um, triple drug therapy is recommended. Why triple drug therapy? Because resistance patterns to these drugs evolve quickly during the course of therapy. Um, so this isn't pre-existing resistance often. It's evolution of resistance patterns during the therapy. So isoniazid, rifampin, and ethambutol are often recommended as, as, as the triple drug, keeping steroids in mind for more sick patients. So obviously, doing this in consultation with an infectious disease specialist would be important or transfer to a center where there's an infectious disease specialist, I think would be important. Some final points about BCG. The side effect profile does not become worse with increasing number of doses, as we, as we discussed. If, you, know, you can get these same side effects on your first or second dose as you would during your second year of maintenance. Not, 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 uh, not, uh, not uncommon. Discontinuation rate in the study is low at 7.8%. Those who discontinued therapy actually didn't happen during the second year, third year. Most people who discontinue therapy because of the significance of side effects, it happens during the first year. So if it's going to happen, the first year is not uncommon when this will, when, when this will occur and, not, and that's not higher in the second or third uh, year of treatment. And the rates are low um, with a systematic plan of evaluating symptoms and directing therapy. Now, intravesical chemotherapy, I think a very simple way to look at intravesical chemotherapy as opposed to mechanism of action, other types of ways to um, segregate um, drug therapy um, in terms of side effects, looking at side effects, is the drug a vesicant or is it an irritant? Vesicants worry us more. They're capable of causing blistering, tissue sloughing, necrosis after extravasation of the drug. So if a peripheral IV is put in, the drug extravasates, you know, in the medical oncology clinics, there's tremendous concern about these drugs and a lot of caution if the IV infiltrates. And a classic one in this drug class that we worry about is mitomycin. That's why we worry about it, because it's a vesicant. Its potential for destruction, if it extravasates, is worrisome to us. An irritant, the drug we really like these days is gemcitabine. That's why we like it. It's classified as an irritant. It doesn't have that same side effect profile. <clears throat> 
Same precautions as BCG, obviously, when administering the drug. Caution's important here, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and good education in the clinic about the best way to administer the drug. You need to be very aware of the importance of hand, genital, and perineal washing to avoid the desquamating eczema-like contact dermatitis that can occur from chemotherapy drugs, but also with BCG. One has to be aware of contact. There, there are occasional individuals who show up with a rash or a balanitis. There's no other explanation for it. I mean, good washing and uh, is an important thing to bring up in the education of the patient. Local side effects are common with chemotherapeutic agents, but they're mild and moderate, and they're self-limiting, especially relative to BCG. They will pass. Systemic side effects are rare. Unrelenting, irritate, avoiding symptoms can be treated in the same manner, anticholinergic therapy, but also, also keep in mind there are, there are some um, small series, anecdotal reports um, in our practices by experience, um, steroid pack can be very helpful in modulating the symptoms. So a dose, dose tapering of steroids. The Medrol dose pack, which is already pre-designed to taper the dose for you, a very useful solution. Dr. Witch has brought up the, the potential for calcifications within the bladder from chemotherapy. Um, and so don't be surprised if you see that endoscopically in follow-up. And bladder contracture um, is possible. Not overly common, but certainly it can be the endpoint of intravesical chemotherapy. Doesn't happen commonly. For, fortunately, it's, it's a very low, low rate in, in single digits. And I'm going to wrap it up here um, by just talking very briefly about uh, um, single-dose uh, perioperative and intravesical chemotherapy. Uh, my colleagues have talked about this a fair bit in terms of efficacy and drug choice, uh, but um, one has to be aware, obviously, that being cautious where you've administered the drug, whether it's in the operating room, the recovery room, what environment you've done it in within the first 24 hours, um, you have to be aware of perforation, um, the possibility of perforation, extravasation of the drug, and, and, uh, and cautious evaluation of the individual. I have bullet points on the slide. There is just a systematic way to evaluate a patient, to treat someone who's bothered after placement of the drug. I'm going to use the recovery room because in the United States, I think that's the most likely context in which we um, are evaluating the patient postoperatively where the drug has been administered and they're now recovering in the recovery room, you know, to be careful about what went in, what came out. And um, a cystogram is not needed routinely before administering drug. That was on one of the questions. You know, I think you have to use good clinical judgment that if you um, feel that the resection is not too deep, safe to give the drug, I think that's an appropriate clinical decision. But if you're worried that maybe the resection is too deep, I'm not sure whether I should give the drug, it's high level evidence to administer it. I think doing a cystogram is, is a cautious maneuver, although often you'll see microperforations from a cystogram. But I think caution's important that if you're worried, best to do a cystogram if you're, if you're on the fence about whether to give the drug or not. And I'm going, to, I'm going to finish up by going back to the questions. So the, for question number one was, which of the following is not true? Obviously, it's the presence of microhematuria is a contraindication to administering BCG. That's not a contraindication. We talked about um, um, these two organisms. What uh, class of drugs or antibacterial drugs are they sensitive to? The correct answer is a fluoroquinolone. Ciprofloxacin would be the correct answer on this question. And finally, which of the following statements about single-dose perioperative intravesical therapy is true? And the audience majority um, did respond with A, and that is the true answer. Reduces tumor recurrence in both solitary and multifocal um, low-grade tumors. Uh, thanks very much. We don't. I'm going to pass on questions right now. I'm going to have Dr. Kamat come up in the sake of not uh, creeping into his time. And at the end, I'm optimistic we'll have about five minutes. We'll have all the faculty come on up, and we can have some uh, questions. Um, thank, thank you for um, not creeping into my time, Kamal. Uh, it, it's, it's much appreciated. So my task really is to kind of wrap this up, and we obviously talk about non-Muslim ways of bladder cancer, tips, tricks, how to treat, classify these patients. But one of the questions that often comes up is, is when do we consider radical cystectomy appropriate for these patients? And I was also asked to include a little bit more about the immuno-oncology, since you've heard a lot about this at the uh, meeting here at, at GEOASCO, and of course next month uh, uh, at ASCO right here in Chicago as well. Well, um, I listed everything I've done with any company. Nothing is really relevant here to this talk other than the fact that I am an advisor and PI on the Merck's Keynote 57 and 676 trials. 
Um, again, you've been through this before, so let's go with, with the pretest. So test question number one, which is not true about BCG failure? And the reason this question is important is because you'll read a lot of papers coming out uh, today that talk about BCG failures. It's important to recognize these little nuances. So what's not true? A, papillary disease recurrence at three months should be called a BCG failure. B, majority of patients with CIS persistent at three months can be salvaged with maintenance BCG. C, majority of patients with papillary regions at three months can be salvaged with uh, maintenance BCG. Or D, the timing of recurrence has prognostic implications. Which one is not true? I miss the music that we used to have with this. Okay, so um, there's a good mix between papillary disease recurrence at three months as a failure being considered not true, or the majority of patients with CIS at three months can be salvaged with maintenance therapy being considered not true. Um, it's actually uh, number three, which 16% uh, if you got correct, and I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit in the talk as well. Um, test question number two, which one of the following is true about radical cystectomy in patients with non-invasive disease? A, in patients, it can be performed with limited lymph node dissection in patients who have clinical T1 um, disease. B, results in improved survival for patients with micropapillary cancer over BCG. C, upfront radical cystectomy is the treatment of choice for patients with small cell carcinoma of the bladder. Or D, must be accompanied with urethrectomy. Boy, this thing is moving on its own. Wow. Okay. Um, no, no, I, I think it's okay. We can. Anybody wants to redo this again? No? Okay. So, to ask question number three, which one of the following is not true about prostatic urethral involvement in patients with urethral cancer? A, the prostatic urethra must be evaluated in every patient who has failed BCG therapy prior to you deciding on salvage intravesical options. B, prostatic stromal involvement is as strong a predictor of poor outcomes as node positive disease. C, Optimal evaluation for prostatic urethral involvement is with a TUR loop biopsy, not a cold cup biopsy, at the 4 and 7 o'clock position. Or D, blue light aided cystoscopy is the optimal mode to detect prostatic urethral carcinoma involvement. So which one is not true? Okay, so it looks like most of you actually did get it right. Blue light doesn't help looking at the prostatic urethra. Um, BCG uh, salvage therapy should always be done only after you exclude the prostatic urethra. And clearly, um, resection with the TUR loop at 4 and 7 o'clock is the best way to detect the prostatic urethral involvement. So let me start out with a little case that kind of drives home the point, why is it important to consider a radical cystectomy in a patient even at the non-muscle invasive state? So this is a 52-year-old male who was uh, referred to the local urologist by the primary care physician for microhematuria. Um, the workup suggested a very healthy person, only sports injuries, was a former smoker, didn't smoke at the current time. Uh, the urologist appropriately performed the CT urogram and, and cystoscopy, and a tumor was seen in the bladder. Um, this was resected, and the pathology um, essentially showed a two-centimeter uh, tumor, which is T1 high grade, and the smaller tumor as well, which you can kind of see there, was also um, T1 high grade. And the um, um, appropriate treatment for this, as you heard earlier, is re-resection, and it was done, and there was no residual tumor present. So this patient was counseled on different treatment options and started on BCG therapy, underwent six weeks of BCG, and then had a negative cystoscopy at three months, and underwent maintenance therapy. Then at six months, the surveillance cystoscopy was negative, but the cytology was positive in this patient, and the patient was continued on BCG therapy, and at nine months, the cytology came back negative. So the assumption was that the cytology had converted and the BCG had treated uh, what might have been remaining in the bladder. At 12 months, the cytology again came back positive, and this patient underwent appropriately cystoscopy, radioscopy, all reported to be normal. Um, the cytology was attributed to BCG inflammation, as far as I can tell, um, and the patient was then continued um, on, um, on BCG. 
Again, in three months, no items of disease. Cytology was, was not done because it was considered to be kind of like a false positive back and forth. But at 24 months, this patient developed gross hematuria. Uh, voided cytology, again, was positive this time. And at that time, the referring doc didn't have blue light, so sent the patient to me for blue light cystoscopy to try and see if we could see something in the bladder. Um, obviously, we did the usual review and, and imaging and, and counseling of the patient. But when you take the patient to the OR, one of the things I always tell my residents and fellows, because they sometimes will go in directly with the operator in place, if you think I'm going to be just resecting a tumor in the bladder, always look as you're going in, even if you have just looked in previously. And, and you can see here, um, I'm not sure it projects well with the lighting in the room, but you can see here this doesn't look really quite um, normal. We used a loop and resected this, and the pathology came back, um, high-grade urethral carcinoma involving the prostatic ducts, asini, and stroma, um, making it T4 disease. So, as I'll show you, this is a really poor prognostic indicator. This patient got dose dense MVAC and N underwent a radical cystectomy. Uh, the pathology in the bladder um, and the prostate was T1 and TIS. Um, margins were negative. But out of the 47 nodes that were removed, six did have um, carcinoma in them, including extracapsular extension. Um, at that point, there was no IOR trials. This patient was counseled on, on different um, chemotherapeutic agents we had and elected to observe. And you can uh, you remember this is a young patient, uh, six months later had widely metastatic disease and, and clearly succumbed um, to his disease shortly thereafter. Uh, despite IO therapy, which then was available. So this was just an important lesson for all of us, that even though a patient has non-muscle invasive disease, we need to make sure we're not missing window of opportunity of cure. And that's why the question really, the, the answer to the question, when should we move to a radical cystectomy in patients with non-invasive disease, the answer is fairly simple. It's is we should do this um, in when not removing the bladder would prevent a loss of opportunity to cure our patients. If you think of it in that sense, it actually is very simple as to when you should counsel your patients to undergo a radical cystectomy. So at initial presentation, and, and you heard this from, from Cheryl and, and Fred and Kamal, uh, you have to think about some patients that are very high risk category, but also some practical issues. If you have a patient that has unresectable tumor, such as a large tumor in a diverticulum, or if the patient has a non-functioning bladder, which the patient admits to you themselves, this is really keeping me up all night, I really can't hold anything in the bladder, you should be counseling the patient on radical cystectomy rather than trying intravesical therapy. You heard about the very high risk and, and the uh, um, uh, criteria for that. Again, just to simplify matters, I'm showing it here again, the high-risk category you can consider any high-grade tumor, including T1 or CIS, essentially. And here we worry about progression. The other risk categories are risk categories for recurrence. So low risk of progression, clearly. The intermediate has a risk of recurrence, but progression occurs only in the high-risk patients. And when you talk about these very high-risk early cystectomy patients, these are the criteria that you saw uh, showed earlier. If you have anybody with T1 high-grade disease that's multifocal, present in the prostatic urethra, accompanied with CIS, variant histology, especially micropapillary, or LVI on the TRBT, we should be counseling these patients to consider early radical cystectomy. And when it comes to high-grade T1, there's, there's often a debate, and we know as, as the errors have progressed that the prognosis of T1 high-grade patients is not as bad today in 2019 as it was probably 10, 15 years ago when the classic Cookson paper suggested that 70% of these patients will progress and only 30% will have an intact bladder at 15 years. It's not that bad, but we still have to keep in mind that T1 high-grade bladder cancer is not a superficial tumor, as the nomenclature might suggest. I used this slide several years ago, and then it, it went viral, and, and it ended up being a publication. But again, I want to show this because it drives home the point. Um, if you look in your practice and you have a patient that has T3B prostate cancer that's Gleason 5 plus 5, 12 out of 12 course positive, and presents with a PS of 75, you would not consider this insignificant prostate cancer. This patient has the same mortality from his prostate cancer as a patient with T1 high-grade bladder cancer. So clearly, when we think about T1 high-grade bladder cancer, we can't really restrict ourselves to it being non-invasive, even though it is, because these patients sometimes and often will behave like they have invasive cancer as far as their prognosis is concerned, and, and it's important to keep this in mind.
The other thing is understaging is very common in patients with T1 high-grade bladder cancer. Um, this is a older paper uh, from 2004, but it drives home the point that if you do a VTUR in patients with T1 high-grade bladder cancer, you can find residual tumor in as many as 62% of patients, but as importantly, you can have T2 disease in as many as 10% of patients. So unless you've cleared out the bladder off T1 high-grade disease, you might be treating one in 10 patients with intracycle therapy that actually have muscle invasive disease, and we clearly know that that doesn't work for this, these patients. Not all T1 high-grade bladder cancers are the same. There are nuances within these. There are different subgroups. Um, so for example, if you have a patient with lymphovascular invasion, clearly this patient is not going to do well with intravesical therapy. In fact, sometimes they don't do well with a cystectomy without chemotherapy either. Um, and many T1 high-grade bladder tumors molecularly will cluster with T2 disease. So you can subtype these T1 high-grade bladder tumors nowadays based on gene expression profiling, and we hope that this advance in, in technology and, and the ability to subtype patients will allow us to select out the poor um, actors early on. Um, and if you look at the early cystectomy versus deferred cystectomy in patients with T1 high-grade bladder cancer, there's tons of data, tons of literature suggest that the sooner you take out the bladder in someone that has T1 high-grade bladder cancer, the better their outcomes. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to have their bladder taken out early rather than later, but we do need to remember this data uh, when we're counseling our patients which is why the AUA clearly recommends that in somebody that has T1 high-grade disease on initial and especially repeat resection, a radical cystectomy should be part of the discussion that we have with our patients. Now, moving to prostatic urethral carcinoma, since that was a topic that Kamal asked me to add into this talk, it is something that's not at, often at the forefront of our thought process when we're thinking about these patients, because we focus on the bladder, we do focus on the upper tracts. Um, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the prostatic urethra is a sanctuary site where a lot of these tumors will hide, especially when they recur in these patients. Now, going into the discussion, or when you first see a patient that has bladder cancer, who is the patient that you should be considering looking at the prostatic urethra? Which are the patients that have a higher chance of having tumor in the prostatic urethra? And this is really common sense. If it's a multifocal type disease, carcinoma in situ of the bladder, 32% of patients with CIS versus 5% without CIS. If it's multifocal, again, it makes sense. If you have a patient that has tumors scattered throughout the bladder, don't ignore the prostatic urethra. It's all a continuation. You will more than likely, at least 30% of the time, find tumor in the prostatic urethra in that patient if you look for it. Location is key. The closer to the prostatic urethra, the tumor in the bladder, the more the chances that your biopsy will be positive. And then again, anybody that's failing or has failed or is on the way to fail um, intravesical therapy, these are patients that you should be considering biopsying and evaluating the prostatic urethra. So really, it's clinical suspicion on our part, it's vigilance on our part, but we have to remember that cystoscopy alone is not sufficient. The image that I showed earlier did show an abnormal papillary type uh, carpeting of the prostatic urethra, but many times you won't see that. You won't see that, and that's why the TUR biopsy of the prostatic urethra is the only way you can reliably diagnose involvement of the prostatic urethra. And that, too, will miss a few percentage of patients, but if you just use a call cup or if you just sort of look at visual estimation, and clearly narrowband imaging and, and blue light technology doesn't help to evaluate the prostatic urethra. And this is based on actual data. So, you know, David Wood, when he was in Michigan, looked at this. He actually had a trial where you had patients with TUR loop biopsy, fine needle aspiration, or transrectal biopsy of the prostate to see which one detected more tumors. And of the ones that were then correlated with radical cystectomy, it was a TUR loop that picked up about 90% of the tumors. Michelle Donat at Memorial, again, looked at this and dated 4 and, and 8 o'clock, and the sensitivity was about 56%. So clearly, you were still missing some of these patients, um, but the specificity obviously is high, and the negative predictive value was about 82%. So if you do that and you miss the prostatic urethral involvement, you know, you can't help it because you can't do much more than that, but do a good TUR loop biopsy, and you will pick up a large percent of these patients that have involvement or the prostatic urethra. And this is a nice slide that I got from Seth Lohner, actually, um, from um, the pathologist with the whole mount at uh, Baylor, uh, where you can clearly see here, this is where, when you look at, uh, this is a radical cystectomy specimen with the prostate in place, and this is where you have the ejaculatory duct. So it's not just that you will pick up more of the disease if you resected that area, 
But that's the place where the tumor tends to invade first, go along the ducts, and become T4 disease or stromal involvement. And that's the reason that the 4 and 7 o'clock where the ducts are gives it the highest yield of picking up deeper invasion in the prostate, which is a very poor prognostic factor for our patients. So if you look essentially in patients who failed BCG therapy, this is just one example where a large percent of these patients will actually have uh, disease in the prostatic urethra um, just by virtue of the fact that they have failed BCG therapy. Um, and again, this is made it into our guidelines. Um, it states it's a strong recommendation. Take a biopsy of the prostatic urethra in cases of bladder neck tumor when CIS is present, if there's a positive cytology and you don't see anything in the bladder, or obviously when you see something that's visibly abnormal in the prostatic urethra. And if you don't do that the first time, when you see the patient back for the surveillance cystoscopy, consider taking him back to the OR to do this. If you hadn't done it the first time, there's no harm or shame in, in saying, I need to do my first surveillance under anesthesia so I can sample your prostatic urethra. Variant histology is something that we hear and talk about a lot. That was at multiple abstract sessions here at the AUA. Um, Cheryl showed this earlier as well. A large percentage of variant histology is not recognized in the community. This number is getting lower just because of us as urologists and, and at the AUA and SUO um, beating this point home that we as urologists want to hear from our pathologists if there's any suspicion of variant histology. And this includes really lymphoepithelial plasma cytoid and nested variants, which are still not reported by the pathologists as much, but have really poor prognostic imp implications. Micropapillary and small cell luckily are reported a lot more nowadays, and we're able to tailor our therapy uh, for our patients with the appropriate response from our pathologists. This was just a flow chart from a publication that Dan Willis and Seema Porton, who's now at UCSF, uh, put together when they were at MD Anderson. So if you have a patient with non muscle bladder cancer um, and they have conventional urethral carcinoma or squamous or glandular differentiation um, or nested variant or other variants that we just don't know what the data suggests um, we should do, um, as of now, restaging TUR and then going on with intravesical therapy if there's no concerning residual disease or if they have T1 disease or um, recurrent um, CIS in the bladder, considering early cystectomy is the way to do it. If these patients have sarcomatoid disease in the bladder, plasmacytoid variant, or micropapillary, uh, consider early radical cystectomy for these patients. If they have small cell carcinoma, even on a TUR that says that it's TA, which can happen, these patients should get new adjuvant chemotherapy because small cell carcinoma in the bladder should really be considered as a, a local manifestation of a systemic disease. And unless you treat the patient with chemotherapy, you're not giving these patients a chance of being cured. So even if it's non-invasive, which is not very common, but does happen with small cell carcinoma, these patients should get new adjuvant chemotherapy. And of course, if they're pure squamous um, or, or, or adenocarcinoma of the bladder, um, early radical cystectomy really is the only effective treatment option for these patients. So now moving into what happens after failure of intravesical BCG. Um, right off the bat, I do want to again emphasize this whole reason to recognize this new term of BCG unresponsive disease. It was in discussions with the FDA that the group here at GUASCO, then the International Bladder Cancer Group, of which several members are, are present in the audience here, um, came together and came up with a unified definition um, not only to help the FDA look at the different trials that were being reported, but also to help us as investigators and to help companies and pharma that were going into the space have a uniform definition so they could study these patients appropriately. So what is BCG unresponsive disease as of today? When you read a paper, when you design a trial, when you're conducting these studies, um, BCG unresponsive disease essentially, and the FDA has adopted this in their, in their official statement, is a disease state where more intravesical BCG is not going to help. That's what it is. And who are these patients? So these are patients who have persistent or recurrent CIS within 12 months, so one year, of adequate BCG therapy, which is at least five of six of an induction course and at least two of three of one maintenance course. If they have recurrent TA or T1 disease, so papillary disease, then the time course is shortened. It should be within six months of the last exposure of adequate BCG. And clearly, if somebody has T1 high-grade disease immediately after induction BCG, so at the three-month evaluation, these patients are extremely high risk, so they do fall in this BCG unresponsive uh, category. And again, this is something that the FDA has openly um, adopted as their um, strategy to evaluate single-arm studies moving forward. 
and as I mentioned, adequate BCG should include at least one induction course and one maintenance course. And for practical reasons for trial enrollment, the patient could have missed one of each before they are considered BCG unresponsive. So what options do we have? And, and again, I'm not going to go into all of these in too much detail here, just for interest of time. But I do want to mention that valdrubicin was the only one, uh, only agent to date that we have that's approved in this disease state. But the CR at six months was 18% in that study, and the two-year disease-free survival is only 4%. So personally, I don't use it. I'm not sure anyone here in the room truly uses it. It really does not work anymore. And again, it was approved. It's all we have. And sometimes peers insist that we use this. But if you tell them that I don't want to use it because the efficacy is low, let me use an alternative agent, oftentimes they'll come back and say yes. Um, the SWOG study, and this is looking at gemcitabine after BCG failure, the two-year disease-free uh, survival was only about 20%. So this number holds true for any intravesical agent, and, and most of them fall within the 17 to 22% range at two years, which really is one in five patients. It's not bad, but it's not the bar, clearly, that we want to have for these patients. Now, gemcitabine and docetoxel is a dual doublet combination that Mike O'Donnell developed at his place, and now it's been adopted across the United States. It combines a vesicin and an irritin, so you have two different uh, potential toxicity uh, mechanisms, but you also have two different efficacy mechanisms because their mode of action is different. And systemically, we always combine chemotherapy, so why not do this in the bladder? We can see here that in patients, including those that had failed two or more courses of BCG prior, the 12-month data is 54%, which is actually very good. If you look at some of the reports here of agents being studied on clinical trials, they don't hit this number. And to be durable at 34% at, at two years is fairly impressive. So again, this is a combination that's off-label to use. You do have to talk to the payer sometimes to show them the data, but they will often approve this therapy for your patient. Now, hypothermic mitomycin um, has been used. Uh, Fred alluded to that earlier. It's available in Europe. We don't have this here in the US. The combat system, which is not radio frequency, but it's heated chemotherapy, is potentially going to be available uh, on a study trial basis here in the US. But it is fairly reassuring that in studies done in Europe, there's a signal that you see in these patients when you use enhanced chemotherapy. In this case, it's, it's uh, heated chemotherapy in the bladder. Now, moving to the IO realm, when it comes to BCG immunology, we always thought that we didn't understand how it worked, but with the advances in tools, et cetera, et cetera, we know how it works nowadays. And there's a lot of molecules that are involved in being studied, and you saw ALT uh, presented yesterday by Sam Chang. But the PD-1, PD-L1 axis is relevant in, in the BCG-treated uh, patients as well. And also, there's this innate and adaptive immunity that's um, uh, induced by BCG therapy. Um, Brandt Inman showed this many years ago, where you have an upregulation of PDL1 um, staining in patients who failed BCG. And this is just the background that led to a whole slew of trials. This is just a, a listing of trials that look at checkpoint inhibitors in this arena of patients who are BCG unresponsive, essentially. The only trial to date that has its uh, data available for public release uh, is the Keynote 57. This is uh, updated data that was presented a few months ago at GU ASCO on the cohort of patients with CIS. This is 130 patients with the CIS plus or minus papillary um, disease. These patients got Pembro, 200 milligrams every three weeks, and then were evaluated um, as per our standard of care. And this is essentially the breakup of these patients um, who were in this cohort. So you can see that, that the median number of BCG installations was fairly high, 12, prior to them going into the study. And as you would expect in this cohort, there was 63% of patients with CIS only, and the others were a mix of TA um, and T1 disease. So this is the money slide here, and to be honest with you, we do expect when you have an intravesical agent, just with the immune inflammation response that you generate by putting anything in the bladder, you will get about a 30 to 50% response rate at three months. With a systemic agent, this 40% response that we saw at three months um, was fairly impressive, to be honest with you. It's not something that many of us were expecting because it's a systemic agent. You're treating CIS. CIS is on the innermost layer. So getting a 40% response rate was something that was um, a little bit unexpected and, uh, and, and fairly gratifying. Um, and also, none of these patients progressed to T2 disease, which is something we always worry about when we're treating patients that are truly BCG unresponsive. Um, what's 
actually even more encouraging than the 40% um, three month response rate is the durability of response. So we see this in lung cancer, melanoma, metastatic bladder. With the checkpoint inhibition, the response rate really is in the range of about 20, 23% for metastatic bladder cancer, but you see a nice tail. And it looks like in the non-invasive cohort of patients as well, out of the ones that respond at three months, we are also seeing this tail. Now clearly we need to wait for the data to mature and be um, uh, uh, followed more. And there are other trials, this is SWOG study looking at TESO, which again is a very similar agent, similar um, uh, cohort of patients. So hopefully when you have pool numbers, we'll see that this number holds true of a roughly 40, 25% um, response rates. There are several other studies, and I'm just showing this to, to prove a point that these are coming into our realm. So as urologists, oftentimes we sort of ignore checkpoint inhibition. We think it's a, it's a uh, um, treatment for metastatic disease. These are moving more and more into our realm. Um, this is a trial of NEVO with IDO inhibitor with BCG. So it clearly combines IO with BCG therapy. And you can see here that of all the registration studies that we have nowadays, some focusing only on BCG, some comparing TICE BCG with um, checkpoint inhibition, there's a lot of interest in our arena of combining intravesical agents with checkpoint inhibition. But keeping all that in mind, we have to remember when we're counseling our patients that radical cystectomy is an option that reduces the risk of dying from their cancer more than any of these other therapies, more than checkpoint inhibition, more than anything else we have nowadays. And that is something that the, I hope I've been able to drive home, uh, is something that we should discuss as a counseling point for our patients anytime we have high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, do you want me to go to questions or open up for a Q&A? Thank you very much. Uh, I practice in a rural uh, setting in Michigan, and the closest, you know, good-sized hospital is about two hours away. And the community hospital I'm working with, in the last four months, I've got no BCG, zero, and there's none on the horizon. So my question is, is when you're dealing with maintenance or you're dealing with um, high-risk patients, do you, is it better to go to intervesical chemotherapy or should I be just telling these patients you got to take two hour trips and try to refer them to other urologists like what's your thoughts with that so um, I, I, I get this question a lot you know at places where you have BCG what we've done at our center is break up the vial into one-third dose so you can treat three patients in with one vial and of course you have to code it and bill it appropriately but in your center where there's no BCG at all um, the statement that we put out to the AUA and the SUO is to consider intravesical, obviously talk about radical cystectomy, um, but to consider intravesical chemotherapy based on the risk category of the patient. So if they're T1 high grade, uh, uh, gemcitabine docetaxel. So the doublet, if they're T1 or CIS, if it's TA, then single agent is still appropriate. But if they can travel two hours, I mean the intravesical uh, BCG is still standard of care questions that I'd like to pose to you. The first one is in a patient where you have to do a prostate resection, a TERP, as well as the resection of the bladder tumor, would you still do like gencitabine, gencitabine in this patient? CIS in the uh, prostatic urethra, that really is a category or a risk category that is less likely or unlikely to respond with perioperative uh, intravesical chemotherapy. The uh, target population for the perioperative installation of gemcitabine is really going to be your low risk patient. In the trial, the, the group that benefited the most were people who were truly low risk. So for that patient that you're worried about CIS and the prostatic urethra, that's a higher risk individual that I would not use the perioperative gemcitabine. In the case uh, that you did a TERP for a benign prostate disease, I mean, the patient is obstructed and has a, a bladder tumor. 
Yeah, you, you do Get see that question. sometimes. If you do a TORP for a benign prostate, yes. and you accidentally find a small bladder cancer. You also do, of course, a small TUR of the bladder tumor, and then I would give one installation. I don't you think would that give? If the, the, we don't do TORPs anymore. We do laser. So if you have a TORP, of course, you have the risk of bleeding, and then I wouldn't do that. But if it's clear, I don't think there's a major risk. So just a caution maybe, point maybe there. The next question. Uh, just a caution point there. I wouldn't use mitomycin though, because um, in patients, and it's been reported, they've had a TRP and mitomycin at the same time. The TRP doesn't heal quite as well. Yeah. Gemcitabine's a lot less uh, vesicant. In fact, it's not. So if you're going to use something, use gemcitabine. Like I told you, I don't use mitomycin for a single post op We use epirubicin, which is also less uh, aggressive. Thanks for the question. How do you manage uh, PSA rising during BCG maintenance? Because it's a very common problem. Is the same you do antibiotics or you follow like a regular patient? Uh, what we do is, of course, do a rectal examination. If you're really afraid that there's something, we do an MRI. And in the worst case scenario, you take a biopsy. And what, what you're aiming at, usually it's granulomatous prostatitis. So I try to be as conservative as possible, but sometimes you have to do something like rectal or an MRI or maybe even a biopsy. Next question. So for, for um, every once in a while, I'll f incidentally find a small bladder papilloma, and path pathology reads it as a papilloma. Do those patients need to be followed at all? And for the pun lumps, uh, how are they followed? Uh, are they followed the same as a low grade? Do you want to? Um, sure. I mean, so the guidelines state that these patients don't need to be followed, but patients are anxious and they sort of demand that they do want to be followed. So I end up seeing them at year one and then sometimes at year two, but then I strongly encourage that they go back. Um, but no, I mean, the guidelines state that they don't need to be followed. For both pun lumps and pun Correct, because those are considered actually benign lesions. I, I think pun, pun lumps, though, are not, not clearly... It's not clear, Benign. but for, for as far as, uh, so again, there's a push to even having patients with actual cancer, TA low grade disease, discharge after one to two years of surveillance. So with pun lump, it's not really recommended that you follow them, but most of them you'll see in a year, um, and then they're clear, and then you discharge them. And just to clarify with gemcitabine, there's no, you know, those those scary fistulas you can get with the, with mitomycin, those will not occur with gemcitabine? They haven't been reported, I have. and I haven't seen a single okay. one. Okay, thanks. I haven't seen a report of that either. I wish to ask you what is your opinion regarding the uh, two types of um, maintenance therapy with BCG. Uh, after I teach all my colleagues that uh, LAM uh, maintenance therapy is very good, appears the Spanish group with Queto, uh, they are going to give only 10 uh, administration of BCG and they sustain that everything is okay. After that appears Brausi from uh, uh, Italy. Uh, he says, uh, yes, uh, somewhere, somewhere uh, near the Spanish group. In your experience, which kind of maintenance therapy is best? I know only 60% of LAM uh, professor, 60% uh, of the patients finished the three years uh, uh, follow-up. But in your opinion, which one is much better for daily practice? So let me address that briefly from the U.S. side, and then Fred, if you could chime in from the European. In the uh, uh, 6 plus 3, I mean, it's been shown in multiple studies that the 6 plus 3 is the uh, treatment recommendation. And that 16% finishing three years is back in the 1990s when we weren't that smart, right? Today, less than 10% of patients stop treatment because of toxicity, as, as Kamal pointed out. So in the U.S., 6 plus 3, and yes, uh, you know, you can come up with other trials, but the difference in the curves between maintenance and induction is biggest and largest when you use the LAM protocol or the SWOG protocol. Fred? Yes, and Professor uh, Wiches is the same. Yeah, the compliance with BCG is much better now, and it's not because we are more smart, because we do better. Um, I've been trained with six uh, uh, installations and then uh, 10 times monthly. That was my training uh, in the 80s. But since the SWOG trial, we now also use uh, the SWOG schedule. So th uh, three installations at month, three, six, 12, etc. We have to realize there are no comparative trials between maintenance schedules. So whether other maintenance schedules are as good, to be honest, I don't know. But what we do know is that the SWOG schedule definitely works well. Regarding hyperthermic mitomycin, uh, there was a the, the HIM trial in UK that the, where the results were not that amazing. Uh, do you have any comment on that? 
With what? The him trial Chemo on ah, okay. optimizing. Um, well, you should look at my editorial comment for the article. Uh, there are a lot of limitations in the trial. For example, there was no pathology review when patients came in. There was no pathology review for the final uh, um, uh, results. And basically, that's the only trial where hyperthermia did not improve well with CIS. So whether that's the truth or all the other trials, I don't know. But the trial has some uh, severe limitations. And, and there is the, there is now the U.S. trial that's opening in the space of chemohyperthermia, so you'll see that opening around the country. Uh, Dr. Kamad, I'm, uh, I've been to a no number of bladder symposiums here, and I really uh, applaud you for taking an aggressive approach for the T1 grade 3, because we all have lost a number of patients that we have followed. I'll cite you an interesting study, T1 index by a center of excellence, Cleveland Clinic, 10 years ago, was published by Brian Butler. So in hands of good urologists, 33% ended up at cystectomy of having positive nodes or equates to death. We do not follow T1 better, so I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you uh, took that stance. On the other hand, I'm in the community now, a rural community, the elderly uh, population is increasing. It's very hard to refer these down to the clinic for center of excellence for cystectomy. They're 82, 83. And what I would say is for us guys in the community, we need more better ways to preserve the bladder safely, extend time, not necessarily cure them. And what I would be leading into, I think that we should explore more developments in partial cystectomy. It's easier on these older people. Yes, it's a multifocal disease, but a couple of cases that you showed, I really think that if we get good with the robot or we can do more partial cystectomies, it's an avenue in surgical intervention that might help us take care of these elderly patients. The last thing is, is CIS refractory, we're never gonna get checkpoint inhibitors out in these poor hospitals. Have you seen anything about just straight fulguration, rollerball fulguration at CIS? Is that a way that you can treat a refractory situation? Any comments on that? Um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut that short. I, I hope this dialogue can happen off the stage, and the others who had questions of faculty will hopefully mingle for another minute or so, but there's pressure on having to use this room. So appreciate everyone's attendance. Please don't forget to fill out the survey and to do your post-test when you get in a day or two. Maybe you'll win 150 bucks. Uh, good luck. Thanks for attending today.